I'm Karen Moss. I am the uh, I'm professor of critical studies and the instructor for the Visiting Artist Seminar. And I would like to welcome you today uh, to our Roski talk by Candice Lynn. We're very excited to have Candice here today. Um, and I want to just let people know that the lecture will last from about 10 till about 1045, 1050. We'll have time for about 10 minutes or so of Q&A with the audience. And then we will uh, resume with the members of the Visiting Artist Graduate Seminar. So if you are a member of the public, um, we will kindly ask you to sign off after the Q&A. So uh, without any further ado, uh, we have graduate student, is it Lauren? Who's introducing? Yeah. Yes. So Lauren Guilford, one of our first year MA curatorial students, will now introduce Candice Lynn. Hi, Candice. Um, so I'm, I'm an MA at the Roski School, and I'm so, so honored and excited to have you um, here this morning. Uh, so Candice's work, um, sorry, Candice uh, works here in LA, and she received her bachelor's uh, degree in visual arts and semiotics from Brown and her MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, she was included in the 2018 iteration of Made in LA at the Hammer. Her work has also been exhibited at Porticus in Frankfurt, uh, Moderna Musette in Stockholm, uh, Beton Salon in Paris, and at the New Museum and the Sculpture Center in New York. And Candice will also be participating in the forthcoming Prospect Biennial in New Orleans and the Guangzhou Biennial. Um, and I would like to turn the screen over to Candace now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you all for being here pretty early. Well, I guess not that early for us, but early for um, some talks. Um, yeah, so I, um, I thought I would talk about some recent projects and maybe tie it into some older projects from a couple years ago that maybe are a little better known. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, can everybody see that? I can't, I can't. Now you guys are all like little boxes. So if anybody- yes, needs we can to, totally see that. Okay, anybody <laughs> needs to like interrupt or um, ask a question or if there's an issue, just like verbally interrupt me, please. Um, okay. All right. So hope everybody is doing as well as possible in these, um, these very apocalyptic times. I thought I would start with this um, show, which was the last show that I installed in person, which opened earlier this year, which feels like eons ago, um, and had to close, I think, a week or two early because of COVID. And ironically, this ceramic sculpture installation was um, kind of intended as within the art historical tradition of like Memento Mori, um, where there's a kind of presence of, or of impending death or a reminder of the fleetingness of life as a way to reorient um, what we find important in life. And, you know, I made this, you know, during a time where a lot of things were already happening, but COVID wasn't happening. The wildfires of this year weren't happening yet. Um, and so these things have already like made us maybe be in this mentality where we're, we are reorienting what we prioritize in life. And um, I feel like we're living in a time of memento mori anyway. And so this piece seems just maybe more apt. Um, it's a self portrait of myself as a, as a tomb demon, as a locapala and, um, oh, no, it's not letting me advance. Oh, I guess I just clicked that. And uh, a portrait of myself as a tomb demon with my future cats. Um, I think I will always probably have cats no matter what, what age I am at when I die. And it's a, um, 
sarcophagus that's kind of based on 6th century Etruscan sarcophagi, which were often made out of low-fire terracotta. And, um, and it's filled with dirt and compost and composting worms and requires daily feeding um, of people's like old vegetables that worked at the gallery and watering to keep the, the soil damp. I hope the noise of construction is not too disruptive. They, they started up again. Um, this is Zoom life. And um, and so before we before we close the show early, I had to go out there and kind of free the worms, make sure they didn't dry out and die in the in the sculpture, and then also take home the other sculptures, which were located in the mezzanine gallery, in vitrines, which were um, these porcelain sculptures that are meant to resemble almost like alien skeletons that are covered in a meat paste that's made from powdered meat. Um, my hair and fingernails and uh, dried skin. And it's being eaten by um, flesh eating beetles, which are often used in museum conservation or like um, to clean bones off for natural history museums, um, revealing the kind of porcelain bone structure underneath as the exhibition went on. And I also sometimes put in Pray that my cat Roger um, caught. This one was a very big rat that he caught um, that the beetles made short work of and they, uh, they ate even the, the bones. So it was nothing was left at the end. And they smell really bad. They're in my studio and I keep feeding them kind of hoping that they'll die off, but they keep making new generations. I guess they're, they're happy there. Um, and yeah. So that was the that was the last show that I installed in person. And then, you know, like all of us, a lot of shows were postponed and canceled. And um, there has been a whole rethinking of like how to do how to go on and do exhibitions in this time period. So I just opened a show at, called Pigs and Poison that was scheduled to first open at the Times Museum in Guangzhou in March. And that was postponed till next year. And it was always supposed to travel to New Zealand and, and to Bristol in the United Kingdom. So we decided to install it from remote. So um, this was an interesting experience. I hired someone to help me with SketchUp. We made a lot of videos. SketchUp models, PDFs, and Zoomed pretty much every other day for two and a half weeks, installing this very elaborate show at the Govett Brewster Art Gallery in New Plymouth in New Zealand, um, which just opened a few weeks ago, or maybe it's been a month ago now. So this work, A Robot Spoke What My Father Wrote, is a barricade piece that is inscribed with Chinese characters that my dad wrote out um, in calligraphy from a Google translation of the phrase meaningless squiggles. Which I, um, some of you who go around LA may have seen in um, an earlier iteration in 2019 in May at Gibali Gallery. And in New Zealand, they have this pink wood that they use to, for their construction, I think it's some kind of, um, insecticide because they're pretty high on biohazard control. And um, the barricade is locked and the, the only way you can kind of get into the exhibition is going down the wall into the hole that is cut at the end. And when you cross through the other side, you see that it is carved in the English translation. Um, so you can kind of see their meaningless squiggles. And that's a phrase that comes from the philosopher John Searle's 1980 essay, Minds, Brains, and Programs, where he uses the metaphor of the Chinese room to kind of talk about how do you know if um, a respondent in a room is a human or a, um, or a robot, and it's kind of, 
for Searle, it's about definitions of, of humanness in terms of artificial intelligence. But I was interested in using the phrase and the metaphor as a way to just think about racialization of borders and disease and um, how we define human in those terms. So inside um, the gallery space, once you cross over the barricade, under the barricade, are two sculptures I call witness sculptures. And, um, oh, this thing is really annoying me. Okay. And um, they are wearing these ceramic masks that I modeled on slave iron bit muzzles and um, medieval European scold bridles, which were um, social shaming devices put on people, usually women, who were too outspoken. And the figures also wear these cloaks that are custom woven from designs um, that I made from drawings that I'm going to talk about later that I call the plant drawings. And then moving up through the space in the Govett Brewster Art Gallery, which is vertically stacked, were some 2D works that um, specifically relate to the histories I've been looking at, which are investigating how 19th century Chinese indentured labor was tied to our US immigration policies that we still have today. Um, so this, this sculpture is one of um, several parts of Vermin Visionary. And um, can you hear that? Yes. As the sound of purring as you go up the stairs and you kind of can like lean in and hear it. As a funny side note to that, um, it's my, it's obviously it's my cat, Roger, who um, has been featuring prominently in my work since quarantine. He's just crept in there because he's like my only, uh, I was about to say human interaction, but he's my only, uh, he's my only species interaction usually in person. And um, he does this thing where he purrs really loud when he's mind controlling me to get snacks. So I just recorded him when he was doing that. And oh, I can go back down to here. And the central work in the 2D works on that gallery is this is an older piece called Map to an Unknown Sea, which is a handmade paper that I made from boiling opium poppy stems, indigo, sugar cane stems, cotton, yucca, and tobacco. And, um, and this piece is just kind of thinking about um, interspecies relationships to that Chinese indentured labor. So I was looking at the ways that that labor was connected to all these different plant histories and made this piece that kind of looks like the inverse negative space of the, the oceans between the US and um, uh, Europe and yeah, kind of negative, I don't know how to say the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> um, okay. And then that piece is flanked on either side from these new oil paintings that I've been making with encaustic wax and lard and pigment. And this one depicts um, the Chinatown in Honolulu in 1900. Around the turn of the century, there were several outbreaks of bubonic plague that were um, blamed on their Chinese residents. And um, these neighborhoods were evacuated of white residents and were kind of forcibly quarantined and parts of them were burned because that was believed to be the only way to get rid of the disease. Um, so it's just this weird, very um, eerie kind of echo into what's happening now in a different way. I should say that I made all this work, you know, in 2019 and even starting in 2018. So I made all this work before coronavirus um, was a known thing, but uh, history just repeats itself. So we find strange resonances now. Um, there were also two images of people sorting rats. Um, and rats were collected in Chinatown and dis dissected for signs of plague. They were also part of this kind of racialization where language of animals is used in relationship to race. So Chinese were said to eat rats. And that was one of the supposed causes for the spread of the bubonic plague in, in the different cities in the US in the turn of the century. And then there were also 
the plant drawings that I referred to earlier that the cloaks were woven of. And these are a series of drawings I started in 2018 that are based on plants I was researching that I would also make tinctures of. So I would take like um, opium poppies and soak them in alcohol for six weeks and shake them every day. And um, when it was done, I would take a dose of the tincture and make the drawing. And um, that's the title of the plant is usually just always the Latin name of the plant. And the imagery isn't like anything illustrative. It's just whatever comes to mind while my body is under the influence of the plant. And they're painted with an ink that I made from oak galls that I collected from California. And the oak galls are this, this like kind of weird growth that grows on an oak tree um, from parasitic wasps laying their eggs in the oak trees. And that's something I've been interested also in my work is like thinking about these interspecies and parasitic relationships that maybe rethink these rigid boundaries we have between species um, to think about how we're all entangled. Um, these are, I forgot to put the plant here. I think this one was California poppy. Um, these ones also have the addition of uh, that, that orange is a red clay that I gather from Sierra Madre right near Mount Wilson, actually, that's burning now. So I'm curious to see what that spot will look like after all this. And um, part of my interest in the oak gall ink was that it, it's one of the earliest forms of European medieval manuscripts used this ink. And it was also the ink used in US post offices for um, a long time up till like the middle of the 1900s as the official waterproof ink that people could like fill out their forms and their um, mailing labels with. And so it's an ink that's not archival, it's really acidic, it eats through paper and it leaves like a ghost image on the other side of the paper that it bleeds through over time. So that was something I was really interested in how, um, how to use these materials to think about like what is missing from those archives and also um, the history of materials that you know eat their own archive or leave ghosts in the archive that was something that i was really fascinated by and there this ink is painted on the reason the pa paper looks kind of modeled is because it's the paper that i used um, to the blotting paper when i was making that boiled um, paper out of plants um, you kind of wick away the moisture by using this cotton cotton pulp paper and it soaked up a lot of the plant remnants and molded a little bit and so I made the drawings on top of that. This is the third gallery space in the New Zealand show and um, it has a sculpture of, it looks more like a bird but it was intended to look like a plague doctor uh, costume with the beak where people would put the spices um, to kind of keep you from getting sick and inside that that costume which visitors are encouraged to put on and in New Zealand they did actually wear it although I was like sure nobody would wear it at this point and we had it an option where it was screencast so you could watch it um, outside of the the costume which was not ideal but you know this is the time of compromises um, inside there was a VR piece that I worked with this amazing artist Clifford Sage on who helped me um, realize my vision of kind of an alternate version of the exhibition, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. And there were also these three paintings on the wall behind it and a room with sculpture inside. Oh. Um, this painting, Pig Carcass in the Arizona Desert, references the Undocumented Migration Project, which is a project that UCLA professor Jason DeLeon um, started and he's an anthropologist with a, with a team of researchers where they went to the Sonoran Desert and they were trying to find a way to track um, bodies that are that die trying to cross the border but are not recorded in the numbers. Um, so they used as surrogates the bodies of pigs dressed in human clothing and they just are these really eerie images. Um, and then this one is an image of um, a house is kind of a stopover stop house on the way. 
um, which was something I was also thinking about. I was reading in the 19 history, um, immigration history of these, these migrants known as coolie laborers, um, how they also had these stopover houses, which um, were used to kind of house them in, in attempting to cross the US-Mexico border. And a lot of the, um, the border kind of politics and um, stations that exist on the US-Mexico border, even the term illegal alien was first um, created in relationship to these Chinese immigrants who were attempting to, to come in during the time of Chinese exclusion. Um, and so it, part, of, part of my interest when I started working on this series was because I, you know, I grew up where a lot of the Chinese family friends we had um, are super politically conservative and um, have, have, you know, voted for Trump or ha like agree with the kind of racist, violent border politics. And so I was really interested in trying to think about Chinese diaspora and history in, in a way that maybe could recuperate um, some cross-racial solidarity, because I intended a lot of this work for a Chinese audience, because it was intended first for the Times Museum to be shown where it's going to be next year. Um, okay. Where's the Stevens? Here's a view of the person wearing, oh, now my button is working, okay. Here's a view of the person wearing the helmet. Um, and this is a view of what the person would see inside. Um, so you can see that the virtual reality environment is um, an alternate view of, of the sculptures installed. These are the flesh lumps that you saw earlier with their like kind of wet and viscous and video game like in the VR. And they're being slung by the trebuchet sculpture in the back, which you'll see in a minute, is also a real sculpture in the exhibition. And those silhouettes that disappear when you try to look at them in the corner of your eye are silhouettes that I drew, took from 19th century kind of racist political cartoons. And, and they just kind of are something that's always in the peripheral of your vision, but something that when you look at it directly to try to see what it is, um, melts away. Okay. And inside that third gallery room is a table of my different research books that is being rained on continually by a pumping system that you can't quite see here. Um, and it's a reference to the 1972 science fiction film Solaris, which for some reason I just find myself returning to again and again. Um, I'll play this little clip so you know what I'm talking about, where the, um, this main character is on a, on a planet that returns to each person. It's a sentient planet that returns the repressed kind of traumatized memories to that person. So this is the end where he goes to his childhood home and he sees his father inside the home looking like kind of confusedly through books while being rained on. And for me, I was thinking about this as like, like the confusion we have with contemporary news or like history because it's so fissured with losses. Like there's so much marginalized history we're not taught that, um, that there's this kind of moment of, um, oh, here you can see that they're wet. Um, so the books here are all the kind of research I have been doing since 2018 on specifically the um, 19th century Chinese migration and labor um, and paintings and drawings that I made from those images in the, those archives. Ah. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This button. Um, and yeah, and so for me, it was like, instead of it being about like the film returns this kind of like personal trauma that you can't deal with. For me, I was thinking about like, what are the marginalized histories globally and nationally that we were never taught or can't quite reckon with. 
Um, so in my in my educational upbringing, I never learned about the coolie labor history and in my parents upbringing in Taiwan, they also said they never learned about it. So I was curious about why that was this this um, aspect of history that was never taught. Okay, and here's the the last sculpture in the show, which was a life size trebuchet um, that would periodically sling these projectiles made out of bone black pigment and lard and oil and wax at the wall creating a kind of abstract painting, if you will, on the back wall over time. And um, this is a reference to an early racialization of disease in the Siege of Kaffa in 1346, where um, it was supposedly Mongols who broke the siege by slinging the dead bodies of horses and humans infected with the plague um, over the walls of the city that caused the Black Plague to um, spread from Asia to Europe. That's kind of like one theory that's not proven. Um, so this, this creation of this um, kind of me medieval weapon is a way to think about that sculpturally, that kind of early racialization of disease. And um, when the catapult is being launched, I had a plague doctor cloak that matches the one that the VR is wearing um, be donned by somebody who works at the gallery, and then they they go through this whole kind of performance of of I think he was really into wearing his hood um, of launching the catapult or trebuchet. And um, oh, one thing I forgot to say is that the reason for the bone black pigment is that. Um, it's also present in that wall in the background of this piece. And this was a, a reference to an earlier work I made where um, in 1873, there was a commission by the Chinese government to Cuba where a lot of these Chinese coolie workers were located um, and they interviewed them about, um, about rates of suicide, work conditions, and there was one there were a couple workers that reported that their bodies were desecrated when they died or committed suicide as a way to dissuade them from doing that and that they wouldn't be buried but would be burned with the bodies of livestock and that that would create lime and bone charcoal which would be used to refine sugar to produce an even greater whiteness um and so yeah that's why i was like thinking about bone charcoal and bone black pigment and how that's still like an art pigment that's often made from um, livestock bones or um, calcium calcium carbonate mineralized version of that um, also ceramic ingredient um, and just the kind of presence of these violent histories within our art making materials that continue to this day so this was a piece that um, that I did an earlier version of the mural that was in the back of the Govett Brewster Gallery. And um, this was from 2018 and it was an installation that was next to the Hard White Body series that I did starting in 2017 that looked at the history of porcelain and plants in relationship to some specific site specific histories of people and uh, events that happened in Paris um, Frankfurt and Chicago, the three locations where the exhibition happened. Um, I'm going to go a little quicker through this since maybe some of it, this is more known. Um, but this was the first version of the show in Beton Salon in Paris, and I created a life-size domestic bedroom that uh, was sculpted out of a little more than a thousand kilograms of Limoges porcelain. and um, was loosely based on the description of the apartment that's in James Baldwin's Giovanni's room. I was looking a lot at archives that had just opened actually earlier the year, that year, April 2017, I think. Um, James Baldwin's archives were made open to the public at the Schomburg in Harlem. And there's lots of really interesting stuff in there if you ever have a chance to, to go there and research. Um, 
but in Giovanni's room, there's um, two characters who are kind of living out their queer love story and the room is described in great detail. So I drew from those details to sculpt this room. And I also was thinking about descriptions of um, Jean Beret, who was a um, French peasant woman from the 1700s, who is probably the first woman to circumnavigate the globe. She did so cross-dressing as the male valet to her lover, who was the botanist on board this colonial expedition that she went on to gather plants. Um, so there were a lot of descriptions of her, her um, journey in the size of the ship cabin that she, she went in. So that those two were the references that I was thinking about in relationship to the room. Um, the first thing you saw when you came into this space was this urinal that you were invited to give your piss to. Um, and, and we did actually, I, I think Parisians really like to donate piss because they gave us more than we could use uh, in the whole three and a half months. Um, and, uh, but it was also, we also gathered the urine from the um, people that worked at the gallery and it was piped along the wall and then distilled and mixed with um, plants that came from this notebook that probably was written by Jean Beret, noting different plants used for calming the skin. And this water was pumped up through a misting system and used to try to keep the fragile porcelain sculpture um, from cracking, which it failed to do. Um, if any of you have worked with porcelain, you know it just cracks really easily, even before you fire it. And um, this, this was after about two months, it had gotten stained kind of yellow and cracked and there, they had a clogged problem with the misting system at some point, so it got very um, broken apart, which was part of the piece was like, setting up a scenario for this entropy to happen and not necessarily knowing or having a, a expectation of what would happen. Um, and then at the end of the three and a half months exhibition, I went back there and I cut the piece into fragments that were fired in kilns and then shipped to Frankfurt where they were recomposed into these islands. Um, it's a little detail of the video. There was a, a video, the same video on the plastic sheeting of the Beton Salon. You just couldn't tell from the photos. Um, and um, in Porticus, there was also the addition of silkworms that were living on the fragments that almost felt like at that scale became these kind of caves for them. And the silkworms were related to um, Maria Sibylla Marion, who was a Frankfurt born naturalist scientist who um, had some similarities to Jean Beret and went to Dutch Suriname on another colonial expedition looking for a replacement to the silkworm. There was also a tie to the silkworm in relationship to disease in porcelain. Um, Louis Pasteur used porcelain to study um, to study bacterial diseases. I think I'm out of order. I was gonna talk about that a little later, but um, silkworms had a disease in, in the French countryside. And so that was, that was something that also linked the two materials. And then at the end of the Porticus exhibition, we shipped all the fragments and research materials and drawings to the Logan Center for the Arts in Chicago. And um, I was really excited that I got permission to make this 20 by 21 foot pool of liquid and flood it so it's got water and porcelain slip and a kind of pumping system inside that circulates the the liquid around and the um porcelain fragments and research materials are all floating in this liquid the plastic sheeting again has the video projected um onto it and so the this image I showed you earlier was um, where I located the distillation system that was in all three versions of the exhibition. And in this case, we didn't invite um, visitors to give us their urine. We just used that of the people who worked in the space. Um, and it was slowly distilled and would drip out um, at regular intervals into the pool. 
So in the beginning of the exhibition, you can see that all the drawings and all the research materials started above the horizon line. And um, as the water got added to, um, it started to mold away and destroy those materials. Oh, this is where I was gonna talk about the filter. So um, Chicago was related to porcelain's history in an interesting way. It was one of the first sites where the domestic version of Louis Pasteur's porcelain filter was marketed to um, a wide audience in, in the US. So the, the Chicago World Fair, the world's Columbian exposition, um, purchased the use of these filters so that people at the fair could have drinking water that was free of cholera and typhoid, which were big problems at the time. Um, and um, oh, one last thing I'll say about that. And one thing I was really interested in, so a lot of the work that I showed you earlier from the Govett Brewster show, my interest in the racialization of disease came actually out of the porcelain research I was doing. So. Um, when Louis Pasteur was using porcelain to study bacteria, he was studying different viral diseases as well, such as the tobacco mosaic virus. And um, it was through the failure of porcelain's ability to filter out the virus because it was smaller than bacteria. It could filter um, bacteria to be studied, but not viruses. It was from that use in the electron microscope later that people were able to actually understand that such a thing as viruses even existed. And so I got really interested in the fact that two really racialized um, materials, porcelain and tobacco, um, were tied to like the birth of virology as like a known science. Um, so for me, that was my seed into thinking about toxicity and contamination and how race plays into ideas of um, purity or, or disease or pollution. So this work is, um, I forgot to ask also how I, I could just talk forever. So how long should I um, talk for? Because I put way more slides than I'll go through in this PowerPoint. Forever, Candace, talk forever. <laughs> oh, Jay. Um, technically, technically we say around 10.45 to 10.50, so we can have about 10 minutes for a Q&A. Okay, so maybe I'll just end after this series. So this was, um, again, so like, it's funny, I showed you the Pitzer show, which closed early from COVID-19. I showed you Govett Brewster, which I myself didn't get to ever see and will not get to see. And um, this show, which was installed at, in Beirut at Ashkel Awan in the Beirut Art Center, um, was closed not to all the you know, horrible explosion that happened this year, but was closed due to the protests. And so this show was also never seen by anyone. So we're really li living in a world of unprecedented, unprecedented times that like many of the shows I'm showing you um, were actually only seen in the way that I'm showing you as pictures. Um, so this installation, Toxic Semiotics, um, is an installation of paintings as well as um, a video installation on this bed of salt. Um, this was sea salt that I made from, I was in, I got to go to Beirut for a month to do the research and produce some of the work. So I collected seawater from beaches in Beirut and uh, Tripoli and Lebanon. Um, where notoriously the water was really polluted from chemical spills and um, boiled that and sol solar evaporated it into sea salt. And so that is creating the kind of like graininess of the video image that's projected on there. And um, the narration of the video is telling the story of, um, from the viewpoint both of myself, like dealing with the kind of fungal infection and from the point of view of a fungus or virus that is traveling around the world in ways that mirror the history of chemical waste um, that, I, that are grounded in actual events that I was looking at that, that, that were tied to um, Lebanese history. So um, I'm not gonna play a clip since um, 
time. Uh, also, I've been really getting, again, I'm leaning into my love of cats. So cats made an early appearance in this work. There were all these um, feral cats, especially around the American University's campus in Beirut. And so part of the video has me reading this story from the Arabian Nights, um, the fishermen and um, the fishermen, what's it called? The fishermen and the demon maybe, um, which tells the story of this like fisherman who finds this, this barrel um, and releases it. So for me, it was this metaphor for the chemical waste. And the cats are tied into the story because there was a, uh, semiotician meeting where they brainstormed ways of signaling uh, toxic waste being buried at certain sites to future generations. And one person's idea was to genetically modify cats to change color in the presence of nuclear waste and to generate a myth that surrounded them that was passed down through generations so that we would know if there was um, chemical waste in an area. And these kind of like ugly tourist paintings that I made, I this was my beginning of starting to get into painting and now I just love painting, which is funny because it was always this medium I kind of hated. Um, and I painted these with pigments that I made from mostly discontinued, hard to find toxic pigments like lead white, uh, lead yellow, um, cinnabar, which is like a mercury sulfide. Um, and um, I painted them uh, on site at different locations where toxic waste had been buried in Lebanon. And this was mainly from a report that looked at the, the effects of the Lebanese civil war when there was a lot of chaos and different countries like the US and Italy took advantage of that chaos to pay um, whoever was in control at that time to let us dump our toxic waste rather than dealing with it um, more responsibly. We would just give it to whatever people were in control in Lebanon at the time and they would take it and bury it in the mountains or dump it um, in the quarries. Um, so some of these sites are places where that was already verified. Um, and this is the one of the beaches I collected seawater from. And this is this was one where there was a report of like the goats that that live on these mountains were actually creating toxic dairy and toxic cheese from the fact that they were they were imbibing so much chemical waste through the environment. Yeah, and that this this I won't talk about this, but this that same story was had a previous existence as a kind of choose your own adventure story that was broken up onto um, these packages that had these labels, um, but I'm, I, I will, I will end there since that's plenty and I could just ramble forever. So, um, yeah. Oh, is it question time? Karen, you're muted. Yeah, if anyone has questions, you can drop them in the chat. Yes, please drop them in the chat. Um, and uh, we have about 10 minutes for this, okay? Okay, we have a question I can see here from Diane Williams. Diane, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah. Hi, Candice. Hi. I'm so excited you're here um, talking to us right now. Um, I'm really interested in how your work is so rich in history and how it's also really process based. So I was thinking, I mean, I was wondering like how um, important um, is it for you to further communicate this um, rich history and the process in your work? Yeah. Um... Are you asking like, do I, I guess like. Yeah, so let's say your viewer is in a museum and they're looking at the work. And um, so they're seeing this object and it really is so um, rich in history. 
And I was wondering how, like if, if like the way that you're talking to us right now uh, and the way that you're describing the work, I mean, this is, we're just so blown away. Um, and I was wondering like if, if you know, if you would um, communicate that further to your, you know, if, if that's important. Yeah, so a lot of times that research material is available, like either in the form of like actual objects that I pull from archives, or it's um, present in the form of like a voiceover that's an audio piece or a video piece. Um, so I, I feel like I want to always make sure the research material is like available, but isn't over determining the experience of the work, because obviously you're seeing me talk about it. It's a really different experience when you go in and you're um, there's a really strong smell or there's a humidity in the air or there's like a kind of visceral bodily experience of the work which I think is also really important um, although harder to there's no way to replicate that um, in a talk um, so I also think there are things that one can get without necessarily like staying and reading every like little wall text or fragment that I that I give so it's not like that's the only way to understand the work. Um, and then in terms of like making the work, I'm looking at the question as you wrote it. Um, for me, like I am both like drawn through the material experimentation as well as through like reading things and getting curious that way. So I think I get interested in a subject um, similar to how I want people to experience the work both materially and like content wise. Uh, Candice, maybe uh, just a slight elaboration on that. I mean, what is so amazing is how uh, the depth of your research and, you know, you're in some cases, the way you responded so quickly uh, to coronavirus and in your most recent work, how, uh, when do you start your research project process and how long does it take typically? Um. So yeah, the work wasn't responding to coronavirus. It it just happened to coincide with that subject matter, strangely. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I started that research in in like June 2018, um, or maybe no, a little earlier. Yeah, because some of the work I made was tied to that that summer. Um, so it's more serendipitous. Yeah. Yeah, the world just is ending and has been ending and I guess like <laughs> there are these resonances that keep going in cycles that the work is tapping into. Uh, we have another question from Ishan. Hi Candice. I just want to say thank you again for sharing. Um, just a really quick question. So what do you think was your primary motivation for including life into some of your pieces? Um, well, I think the first forms of life that made their way into the work were bacterial. I mean, obviously, there was lots of life that I probably didn't intend and wasn't aware of that was in the work. But the work I was doing in um, 2016 had a lot of like fermentation, um, fermentation of mud, fermentation of tea and sugar. Um, and so that bacterial life was important for me as a presence in the work because it was, again, like thinking about symbiotic or entangled or interspecies ways that our existences are formed and like how to think about long trajectories of colonial histories through that lens. Um, and then the work that I've done where, you know, like maybe you were thinking more specifically about insects because um, people sometimes don't think about the mold and bacteria as being alive. Um, but the work with insects, I, got interested in because I was um, researching like porcelain and sugar and tea and it was tied to the history of silk. Um, so I started working with them in that way. And, you know, I often get questions around ethics of that. And um, for me, I don't have like a big moral dilemma around it because um, I guess I never felt that like my practice or as an artist I'm I'm ever like pure or outside of um, the kind of moral decisions of want just living um, so like I accept that I'm complicit in in the kind of whatever small violences of our daily decision making and um, 
these, you know, insects are sourced by me from sites where they're often grown for um, feeding reptiles or whatever. Well, thank you. Yeah. Because we have a number of curatorial MA students here, I'm just wondering if you could talk about whether you had issues in showing your work with live materials in particular spaces. And I was also thinking of the Logan Gallery with the huge pool that you made. Have you ever had issues with that? Or have you had to sign waivers, anything like that? Um, well, it's funny because like I'm often invited and they're like, we want you to do something like blah, blah, blah. You know, that was like, uh, you know, like actually Gasworks, like when they invited me to do the show, I proposed to make this big red stain. And then they're like, we love the idea, except we just refinished our floor and we're really worried about our floor. Can you make sure it doesn't leave a single drop of stain on the actual floor? So there's like often these things where there's an invitation, but there's a lot of anxiety, um, like a need to fumigate or a need to protect, you know, other artworks that are nearby, which I totally understand. So um, yeah, the work is purposefully difficult in some way, I guess, like there's, it, it requires you to really think about that curatorial relationship of caretaking, um, both to the work and to other artworks in the space and to audiences. Um, and yeah, I haven't had to have, have people sign waivers. I haven't had to sign waivers. Um, I would not really like that. I think we already have two waiver liability heavy of a world and I'd rather have a different way of relating. Great. <laughs> uh, let's see, we have a question from Jay Lizzo. Hi, Candace. Thank you for sharing your work today. Um, Jay. I, just, uh, <laughs> uh, I just thought you might just talk about maybe some of your life experiences that helped shape your uh, artistic practice. Um, yeah, like from, you know, going to Brown, the, uh, to you know, working for various artists or anything like that, um, to like help create your kind of like research uh, process, uh, artistic practice. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, those things are always like hard to know, right? Like, I mean, I I grew up in Oregon. I think that was where I got interested in plants, and I was kind of you know grew up like kind of like a hippie. Also was. Um, not allowed to watch TV by my parents who were kind of afraid of like American culture um, affecting me too much. So I read a lot of like 19th century Gothic novels, which I think influenced my interest in history and maybe also my Gothic sensibilities. Um, and, uh, you know, the work keeps evolving. I think I began more as a drawer and sculptor and it was like, I would have an idea and I'd illustrate it or represent it in the work and then it's kind of shifted where the material itself is um, embedded in the ideas I'm interested in. So like, it's more like processes, so like processes of liquid circulating as a way to talk about the circulation of knowledge or, or material um, histories. Um, yeah, and it's just, I don't know. It's just, also there's always like stuff in my student studio or adjacent to my studio that I never consider like the real art that gradually becomes like the real art like the herbalism stuff I was just always doing and then it just became part of the practice and um you know I started making all these cat paintings that weren't part of the practices just because I love cats and my cat and now they're they're in it <laughs> so I don't know it's good to see that you're uh, painting yeah, it's funny. I'm funny. Like, I feel like I've shit talked painting so much, and now I'm like fully like loving painting. <laughs> Thank you, Candace. Uh, Candace, we have a question from David Kelly. Oh, David. David, are you here, David? Hmm. Oh, he's muted. David, you're muted. Hi, sorry. Hi, Candace. Um, my internet's really spotty today, so if I get cut off, I'm sorry. Um, thanks for your talk. It's great to see your recent projects and to, sad to hear about all the problems of people having access to seeing them, but um, strange times. I was wondering if you could talk about, um, and these might not be the words that you want to use to describe your work, but I see it in some of your work um, historically, but how you think about um, uh, magic in in terms of its relationship to uh, how you might use it as a kind of um, practice that um, 
uh, undermines, you know, Eurocentric or eth eth uh, colonial um, uh, and racist histories, and and then you know, and the sciences that are sciences and disciplines that are part of that, and then also how you, in your research you also um, deploy science and history and um, and um, new ways of thinking about those things to to produce the the projects and the the processes that you go through. So I was wondering if you could. Um, Think through that for me, please. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I, maybe I would use ritual more than magic. Um, I think I'm interested in like using materials in relation um, in a kind of concerted or like process-based way to enact some other possibility or, or like way to think of them um, that that is outside of the histories that they've they've been with embedded within. Um, I think also maybe like citizen science or like DIY aesthetics are interesting to me. Like I'm 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 interested in the way that um, just like experimenting with the physics of the world and like the material properties of a thing give rise to other things and thinking about that outside of, um, thinking about that in a tactile and embodied way instead of like how it could be, how it could become a product or how it could serve to like, to fix a certain like official scientific narrative in mind. Um, yeah, and you know, the history of science has always just been interesting to me because it's, um, it is like a kind of material colonial history. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um and so in and then in ritual i guess maybe a, just a second question with that do you think about like how you excavate historic rituals that you've researched and then creating your own kind of new rituals so i guess i'm thinking about like the difference between like quotation and, and then sort of an embodied a new embodied ritual that you are performing through your art making and interaction with audiences. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm trying to think through, like, I think a lot of it is more intuitive, like maybe the closest example to what you're thinking of is like the Chiradachina piece where I was looking specifically at um, Cuban Santeria as it crossed with kind of Chinese folk religious beliefs um, and trying to, because I couldn't find specific research on like what forms that took, I, I did kind of make my own based on um, imagery of um, stuff that I read about. Um, is that what you're talking about, David? I feel like I'm doing a bad job of answering. No, no, I'm maybe, I'm, maybe I'm not, I'm sorry, the in had me, um not able to phrase my question well but um uh i guess i guess i guess i think about you know when i see these kind of alchemical processes that you make with the the different um devices that that are that that have referenced historical things like it could be as simple as the pasteur filters or when you're distilling urine or things like that that kind of conjure up um you know, historic things like like alchemy or early science or or gen, you know, gentlemen European scientists, you know, scientists uh, working in their in their homes and so forth, so that you you um, you quote these things, but then you also make them into your own way of co as a kind of process of commenting on that history and and on a current history. So maybe maybe I'm maybe it's just a comment, not a question. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. alchemy is, is interesting to me um, because it, like it was so also so much like tied to like the philosophical component of like how these processes were supposed to mirror a, a idea of a, a way of life. And I think that's maybe closer to how I'm thinking of the materials where, you know, like I'm not producing like often with the distillation, people are like, oh, are you making alcohol? And I'm like, no, I'm making a stain <laughs> or like I'm making something that's not productive um, by capitalist terms or something. And um, so maybe it's more about like using kind of like uh, processes of science or early science as a way to think about what those like what those conceptually mean, like what does it mean to refine a material, to distill a material, to circulate a material, 
to dye a material, you know, mm -hmm. soak it in the in the fiber of something. Yeah, that that's great. Thanks for for your response. Thank you so much, Candice. Um, and I might also say that I think you're doing a lot of reclamation in the process. You're you're re you're reclaiming things and then authoring them under your own subjectivity, which I think is super interesting. Um, I'm sorry we don't have any more time for further questions. So I'd like to thank Candice for her wonderful lecture and thank all of you from the general public who are attending.